Hello, this is Dr. Max Fung, University of California, Davis in Sacramento, California. In this session, we'll be focusing on blistering diseases with emphasis on inflammatory blistering diseases. We'll start off by examining the key parameters for classifying blistering disorders, including the cleavage plane or anatomic side of the blister, as well as the histopathologic features that give us clues to the mechanism of blister formation, and finally, the nature of the associated inflammatory response, if any. For a review of basic skin histology, please refer to the link below. But let's start by looking at the superficial blisters, the intraepidermal blisters, starting with subcorneal blisters, in which case the roof of the blister is essentially the stratum corneum, and the floor of the blister comprises the full thickness of the nucleated epidermis. The differential diagnosis for subcorneal vesicular and subcorneal pustular disorders is actually quite broad, but we're really just going to focus on the mostly the first two on this list. We've already covered psoriasis in the psoriasiform dermatitis lecture, and the last three entities are pediatric disorders that are almost never biopsied. Blisters that cleave at the granular layer are somewhat distinctive. At first glance, or from low magnification, it might look similar to a subcorneal blister, but there's a slight difference in that some of the superficial most granular keratinocytes are actually present in the blister roof. The differential diagnosis is relatively short but distinctive with the superficial forms of pemphigus and associated autoantibodies, as well as superficial forms of bacterial infections, specifically Staphylococcus aureus, phage group 2, type 71, mediated toxins in localized bulls impetigo or more generalized staph scalded skin syndrome. With both the autoantibodies generated in pemphigus and the exfoliative toxin generated by the staph targeting desmoglein 1. Intraepidermal blisters centered within the stratum spinosum are relatively commonly encountered, attributable to the very high prevalence of the various forms of spongiotic dermatitis as well as superficial herpes simplex infections. Suprabasilar intraepidermal blisters are associated with cleavage planes just above the basal layer of keratinocytes and are associated with pemphigus as well as disorders associated with the epidermal reaction pattern of acantholytic dyskeratosis. Subepidermal blisters occur at the dermal epidermal junction and do comprise the largest and most diverse group of disorders in this lecture. In this session, we will not be covering diseases that were already discussed in the interface dermatitis session, including erythema multiforme, lupus, and lichen planus. We also will not be covering hereditary epidermal lysis bullosa. But all the disorders on the list of subepidermal blistering disorders do have their pathogenesis centered in one or more of the structures of the basement membrane zone, which looks like just a line on H&E, but at higher magnification is revealed to show multiple structures shown here in blow up in a, a diagram that my former co-resident, Dr. Maria Wei, now a professor at UCSF, provided during our resident study sessions. And here we have a close-up of the basal layer of keratinocytes overlying the lamina lucida, and then the lamina densa underlying, and then underlying anchoring fibrils known as type 7 collagen. All of these different structures are the targets for the various diseases we'll be discussing. And in general, the location of the pathology can correlate with the likelihood of scarring. So for example, we're not talking about covering hereditary epidermal lysis bullosa in this session, but EB simplex, which has defects in keratin 5 and 14 within the basal layer keratinocytes is generally considered non-scarring, whereas dystrophic epidermal lysis bullosa, which affects type 7 collagen fibers, the anchoring fibrils is causes devastating life-threatening scarring. And similarly, the acquired immunobullous disorder epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita 
is associated with autoantibodies directed against type 7 collagen and typically results in scarring and milia formation. More superficially in the lamina lucida, we have bullous pemphigoid and pemphigoid gestationis, as well as linear IgA disease, which typically do not cause scarring, although there is a sublamina densa variant of linear IgA that's rare and would be expected to cause scarring. And then mucous membrane pemphigoid, also known as cicatricial pemphigoid, is somewhere in the middle and has different autoantibody targets and obviously can result in scarring. One important aspect of subepidermal blisters is that over time they tend to re-epithelialize and it looks a little bit different from a primary intraepidermal blister. So with re-epithelialization of a subepidermal sub blister, the keratinocytes kind of creep across the dermal blister floor and they have this flattened appearance. And so we can see these keratinocytes and they're kind of spindled, which is not the normal profile for a basal layer keratinocyte. They're normally more cuboidal. But when we have this flattened profile, similar to a superficial granular layer of keratinocyte, uh, we call this basal or squamatization. And it's seen in wound healing as well as other lichenoid reactions, such as lichen planus. But when we, when we see these flattened cells here, that's evidence of a re-epithelializing subepidermal blister. And it should not be misinterpreted as a primary intraepidermal blister. In this image on the left, we can see the primary subepidermal blister on the very left, and then progressively as we move towards the right, a thicker and thicker re-epithelialized re subepidermal blister floor. And we can see that these superficial keratinocytes are flattened in profile. And lastly, blisters associated with alterations in the superficial papillary dermis can also create either a subepidermal or superficial dermal blister. In the vast majority of instances, this is attributable to marked papillary dermal edema, although skin fragility attributable to excessive deposition of amyloid or solar elastosis may also rarely result in a superficial dermal blister. And next, let's see how an understanding of the histopathologic features that reflect the mechanisms of blister formation can complement our knowledge of the differential diagnoses of diseases associated with the different blister cleavage planes. In particular, we should focus on how we can recognize histopathologically both intercellular and intracellular edema, as well as acantholysis and acantholytic dyskeratosis as both can result in intraepidermal blisters. So we have reviewed spongiosis in detail in the spongiotic dermatitis session, but again, it is intercellular edema of keratinocytes. In the epidermis and contiguous adnexal epithelium, referring to follicular and sweat ductal epithelium. And with sufficiently prominent intercellular edema, intraepidermal spongiotic vesicles form, most commonly in the spinous layer, particularly on acral skin, where that thick, compact orthokeratotic stratum corneum kind of holds the spongiotic vesicles intact a little bit longer to the point that they're more likely to be clinically visible, as in dyshydrotic eczema. And associated with immune-mediated cleavage of E. cadherin, which is important for the act actin cytoskeleton uh, as part of the adherens junction. And so those keratinocytes hold on until the last possible bit. And you can often see the intact desmosomes at the periphery of the spongiotic vesicles. In summary, intercellular edema within the epidermis or spongiosis creates intraepidermal blisters, most commonly in the spinous layer. In contrast, intracellular intraepidermal edema has various terms associated with the process, including ballooning degeneration when the cells, the keratinocytes swell like balloons and eventually burst, and reticular degeneration, that reticulated extracellular material that's left behind after the cells burst, the entire process sometimes being referred to as cytolysis. Also resulting in an intraepidermal blister, most commonly intraspinous.
Here's an example of marked papillary dermal edema resulting in a subepidermal blister. In prominent or severe examples of interface dermatitis, one can see coalescing junctional vacuoles forming at the dermal epidermal junction. And at the earliest stages, at least, clinical correlation is required to determine whether the clefts seen microscopically are reflected clinically. In many instances, what looks like a potential subepidermal blister under the microscope is actually not vesicular bullous at all to the clinician's eye. And finally, acanthalysis, which is probably the most important and most distinctive mechanism for blister formation, which is characterized by a loss of the visible cell-cell attachments of keratinocytes at the light microscopic hematoxylin and eosin level. The cells become rounded and discohesive. Acanthalysis is associated with compromise of a critical component of the desmosome, which are those uh, film strip or ladder rung type structures connecting one keratinocyte to another that are visible on H&E at the light microscopic level. And so the desmosomes are associated with the keratin cytoskeleton of the cell and is a much stronger uh, structure holding cells together compared to the adherens junction and the associated actin cytoskeleton involved with spongiosis and E. cadherin. So compromise of the desmosome readily results in a loss of the visible intercellular attachments and a rounding and discohesion of the keratinocytes. Most commonly, this is antibody mediated targeting of a critical structure of the desmosome as exemplified by all the different variants of pemphigus. The distinctive combination of acanthalysis and dyskeratosis, known as acantholytic dyskeratosis, has a short differential diagnosis, including some distinctive vesiculobullous disorders that seem to be associated with mutations in calcium pumps, and in particular, mutations affecting calcium pumps resulting in depletion of calcium within the Golgi apparatus seem to mediate acantholytic dyskeratosis. Characterized by acantholysis mostly in the lower portion of the epidermis, creating somewhat of a suprabasilar cleft. With dyskeratosis localized to the overlying superficial epidermis, including the stratum corneum, where they are traditionally historically given distinctive names in French, so I can't really pronounce this, but corons refer to the more round shaped dyskeratotic keratinocytes and grains to describe the more flattened or grain shaped dyskeratotic keratinocytes. Essentially two different names to describe two different morphologies of the same dyskeratotic keratinocytes in acantholytic dyskeratosis. So acantholytic dyskeratosis results in an intraepidermal blister with a predilection for the suprabasilar region of the epidermis. At this juncture, I do not need to confirm that you are human, but I do need to make sure you're awake and understanding the histopathologic features that reflect the different mechanisms of blister formation. So please pause for a brief moment and sort out these images with the mechanisms listed on the left. And now a clinical quiz for the astute clinicians. If you can make this diagnosis, then uh, you might start to think that you could skip the rest of this lecture. Originally described in 1956 by two physicians in England for whom the disease remains so named. Subcorneal pustular dermatosis, also known as Snedden Wilkinson disease, is characterized by predominantly subcorneal pustules that appear to sit on top of the epidermis. The infiltrate is usually sparse and is not associated with hair follicles. At higher magnification, we can appreciate sparse neutrophils within an edematous papillary dermis and sparse neutrophilic spongiosis beneath a neutrophilic subcorneal pustule that appears to sit upon the epidermis. Like subcorneal pustular dermatosis, acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, or AGEP, has a pretty self-explanatory name. In AGEP, the pustules are also superficial, frequently subcorneal, 
And it's additionally been stated that the presence of sparse eosinophils can represent a clue to a drug etiology, although it's thought that over 90% of cases of AGIP are in fact associated with medications. And like subcorneal pustular dermatosis, AGIP is not associated with hair follicles, although this particular case is interesting to me because the pustule seems to be centered over an acrosyringium, which can represent a general clue to a drug etiology. And in this case that was clinically consistent with AGEP, we have neutrophilic pustules at multiple levels of the epidermis, only one subcorneal. Okay, on to the next case. Astute clinicians, please make your clinical diagnosis. But I know now that the pathologists are thinking, well, this is not a clinical dermatology session. So here's the pathology. And if needed to make or perhaps merely confirm your diagnosis, here is a skin tissue-based ancillary diagnostic test. Pause and interpret, please. Pemphigus foliaceus is characterized by autoantibodies directed against desmoglein-1, which is one of the cadherin family of transmembrane proteins and distributed in the greatest quantity in the superficial epithelium. Pemphigus foliaceus includes a number of clinical subtypes, including endemic pemphigus in certain pockets of Brazil and Colombia, as well as medication-induced and other clinical variants exhibiting overlapping features with acute cutaneous lupus or dermatitis herpetiformis. And consistent with the superficial intraepidermal localization of desmoglein 1, the cleavage plane in all variants of pemphigus foliaceus is superficial within or immediately below the granular layer. And so at scanning magnification, sometimes the impression is that of an epidermis with a missing or eroded stratum corneum, but actually it's superficial acanthalysis that's creating this appearances with the blister roof being floating off somewhere else on the slide, not, not visible in this image. At higher magnification, we can appreciate that the superficial discohesive or acantholytic cells are flattened by profile and contain prominent basophilic cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus. So both the profile and the basophilia mark these cells as granular layer keratinocytes. And the phrase dyskeratotic granular keratinocytes nicely summarizes the appearances of these cells in pemphigus foliaceus. Looking now at the blister roof in pemphigus foliaceus, we can see that there are at least some nucleated keratinocytes, including some granular layer keratinocytes comprising that blister roof. So that is different from the more nonspecific uh, separation that can just artifactually occur between stratum corneum and stratum granulosum. In mild or early cases of pemphigus, the characteristic histopathologic features may not be present at all. Rather, one might only see nonspecific changes with more subtle and nonspecific clues, such as the presence of neutrophilic spongiosis, as well as eosinophilic spongiosis or simply sparse eosinophils near the junction which is most characteristically associated with early bullous pemphigoid, but as shown here, can also be seen in pemphigus. I think this should be as appropriate a juncture as any to pull a slide from the special stains lecture and review direct immunofluorescence testing, which is an indispensable test in the armamentarium for diagnosing immunobullous disorders. Remember that these biopsies are separate from the routine formal and fixed biopsies, that rather the tissue must be placed in a different uh, solution. We call it Mich Michelle's solution. It's an ammonium sulfate solution that goes by other names such as Zeus transport media, but any of these are acceptable. The main thing is do not place the specimen in formalin. We would then take the tissue and prepare it as a cryopreserved tissue specimen, applying fluorescein conjugated commercially available antibodies, standard panels including IgG, IgM, IgA, and C3 complement. Some of the other components of the complement cascade can be used in certain settings or in certain laboratories, but are not considered routine. 
We also have fibrinogen for vasculitis and lichen planus, and it's common in my experience to use albumin as a control slide. And in terms of indications, the DIF testing, perilesional skin, is indispensable for the diagnosis of immunobullous disorders and also IgA vasculitis. I don't regard DIF testing to be really necessary, uh, at least not routinely necessary for lupus, other connective tissue disorders, LP, and porphyria, but it is frequently used as an ancillary diagnostic test in select cases by select providers. Back to Pempigus foliaceus, the characteristic staining pattern on DIF testing is an intercellular or cell surface epidermal staining pattern, typically with IgG and or C3. Now, we can see sometimes that the staining on DIF testing will localize to the superficial epidermis. And in this image here, we can see that it's relatively sparing the basal layer. So if we trace the dermal epidermal junction, it's more or less down here. And so there's kind of a zone of negativity immediately above the red line, but then quickly above the basal layer, you start to see variable intercellular cell surface epidermal staining kind of uh, resembling a, a chicken wire. That's a phrase that's often used to describe the pemphigus staining pattern. And when you see that superficial distribution of the staining, you can suggest pemphigus foliaceous, although ultimately correlation with the lesional histopathologic features as well as clinical correlation is required. And in some cases, serum testing, either indirect immunofluorescence or ELISA for specific targets can be used to supplement or confirm the diagnosis of pemphigus. Okay, next case for diagnosis by dermatologists and pathologists. We often use the phrase herpetic dermatitis to refer to infections mediated by herpes simplex virus, HSV1 or HSV2, or varicella zoster virus, either varicella or herpes zoster. And all of these infections cause essentially identical histopathologic features, including intraepidermal vesicles secondary to intracellular edema, as well as viral cytopathic changes and often extensive necrosis. And sometimes it's the hair follicles that have the uh, most prominent epithelial necrosis. So even the mere finding of confluent necrosis within epithelium should trigger consideration of herpetic dermatitis. And it's known that the virus, when it lays dormant, VZV lays dormant in the dorsal root ganglia innervating follicular epithelium, whereas with herpes simplex it's dormant in nerves that innervate the epidermis. So sometimes you can kind of favor one or the other depending on where the epicenter of the changes are. But in practice, I think you can't rely on it. And certainly we have readily available, reliable, rapid uh, molecular tests to make definitive diagnoses for these cases. Sometimes as pathologists, we're in a position to make a histologic diagnosis before the culture or molecular results have come out, or perhaps there are no other specimens pending, so it'll be incumbent upon us to make the diagnosis. So here at low magnification, we can appreciate an intraepidermal vesicle, and if we look closer, we can determine that it's secondary to intracellular edema, not primarily intercellular edema or spongiosis. And these changes could occur in the epidermis as shown here or in follicular epithelium. At high magnification, we can appreciate many of the affected keratinocytes have a so-called steel gray nucleus, and some of them are multinucleated with the nuclei kind of pressed up against each other, so-called nuclear molding. Some of these keratinocytes also appear to have margination of chromatin. And from this magnification, it kind of just looks like the, the nuclear membrane is relatively thick with all that basophilic chromatin lining up along the nuclear membrane. And looking beyond the distinctive viral cytopathic changes in the nuclei, we can see that the affected cells having swollen and burst have produced an essential syncytium of eosinophilic cytoplasm, and in some areas it has a more reticular appearance. 
So these are some of the accompanying cyto cytoplasmic changes and extracellular changes that are characteristic of intraepidermal blisters formed by intracellular edema. Returning now to immunobullous disorders and pemphigus, pemphigus vulgaris is mediated by autoantibodies targeting desmoglein-3, which is distributed more, most prominently in basal epithelium and is also associated with a much stronger predilection for mucous membrane involvement compared to pemphigus foliaceus. At scanning magnification, we can appreciate a mostly suprabasilar acantholytic cleft affecting the epidermis, as well as contiguous adnexal epithelium, including this hair follicle. The associated inflammatory infiltrate is usually superficial and is mostly lymphocytes, but also typically contains eosinophils, neutrophils, or frequently both. At higher magnification, we can more readily confirm that the blister floor in Pemphigus vulgaris contains more or less a monolayer of basilar keratinocytes. With the rounded and discohesive profiles of these keratinocytes revealing acantholysis as the mechanism of blister formation. Primary histopathologic features are often best preserved at the peripheral edge of the blister. With the classic tombstone appearance of the blister floor in the suprabasilar acantholytic cleft. But once again, in many examples of pemphigus, these very characteristic histopathologic features will not be present, and we might encounter only the more nonspecific pattern of neutrophilic spongiosis. So we can take another look at the differential diagnosis of neutrophilic spongiosis that we first reviewed in the psoriasiform dermatitis lecture. But as you can see that the highest number of entities, although each individually are either very rare or never biopsied, comprise this differential diagnosis of neutrophilic spongiosis. Among the various clinical pathologic variants of pemphigus vulgaris, my colleagues here in the Department of Dermatology, Stephanie Lay and Emmanuel Mavarakis, and colleagues recently reported mounded and refractory keratoses, or MARC, as the distinctive clinical variant of pemphigus vulgaris that has a predilection for the scalp and also tends to affect uh, individuals with skin of color, but additionally had unusually prominent dyskeratosis in some of the biopsies. So in this case series of four patients, two of the four cases, I initially thought it was something else. One of them I think I thought was um, perhaps more compatible with warty dyskeratoma, and uh, the other one, Darier disease, at least at the H&E level but subsequent clinical follow-up and direct immunofluorescence testing proved the diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris in each of these cases. Direct immunofluorescence testing is positive in the same pattern of all variants of pemphigus, including pemphigus foliaceus, but with pemphigus vulgaris, the antibodies are centered in the basilar epidermis. So remember in that foliaceous case that there happened to be a fortuitous relatively sparing of the basal layer, but here it's pretty much all the way down to the basal layer. Although the basal layer or dermal epidermal junction itself should test negative in pemphigus vulgaris, again with IgG and or C3. And for ancillary diagnostic testing, if needed, serum tests are highly reliable as well. Indirect immunofluorescence with monkey esophagus as the most sensitive ideal substrate, or else ELISA for specific targets. Pemphigus vegetans is a variant of Pemphigus vulgaris that starts as erosions, but then progresses to vegetating plaques that are reflected histologically by papillated and verrucous epithelial hyperplasia. And two different histologic and clinical subtypes have been described. Of note, in older lesions, the acantholysis may be minimal. So sometimes simply the presence of an eosinophilic microabscess would be the best clue to the diagnosis at the H&E level.
in this example of Pembicus vegetans, we can see that there's papillated epidermal and adnexal epithelial hyperplasia associated with prominent suprabasilar acanthalysis, more consistent with a Newman subtype. With verrucous lesions, such as those in Pemphigus vegetans, the very prominent dermal papillae in combination with the suprabasilar acanthalysis can result in the appearance resembling colonic villi. IgA pemphigus is a very rare type of pemphigus that's defined by deposition of IgA rather than the typical IgG or C3. And there are two clinical pathologic variants. There's a subcorneal pustular dermatosis or sneddon wilkinson disease type associated with desmocolin 1, as well as a more heterogeneous intraepidermal neutrophilic type. And this is really just a window into some of the very rare variants of pemphigus. So in addition to IgA pemphigus, there's also an IgA IgG overlap pemphigus. And so these, these are beyond uh, the range of further discussion for this session, but to just know that they exist is still valuable. With Haley-Haley disease, we segue into a small group of disorders associated with mutations in calcium pumps. In all of these disorders, DIF testing is negative. In Haley-Haley disease, mutations affecting the calcium pump encoded by the gene ATP2C1 results in calcium depletion in the intracellular endoplasmic reticulum, and the histopathologic reflection of this defect is prominent acanthalysis. When I did a Google Images search for a dilapidated brick wall, about 75% of the images were indeed brick walls, but I think the other 25% were pictures of Haley-Haley disease. But in truth, in order to show you that dilapidated brick wall, I had to cherry pick a portion of this image, which in my opinion really shows more of a suprabasilar pattern of acanthalysis. So with Haley-Haley disease, the, the most characteristic expression is the full thickness dilapidated brick wall. But in my personal experience, more often than not, we see a lot of suprabasilar acanthalysis even more clearly evident at more of a scanning magnification. Another aspect of Haley-Haley disease that I think can be tricky is that we always use the absence of dyskeratosis in Haley-Haley disease to distinguish it from the other disorders that show acantholytic dyskeratosis. But in reality, in Haley-Haley disease, one can see limited dyskeratosis. So we like to see minimal to absent dyskeratosis, but it's often not zero. Here's another example of clinically and genetically proven Haley-Haley disease uh, with its characteristic prominent impetigenized crust, but again, mostly a suprabasilar acantholytic cleft. Here's the next case for clinical pathologic diagnosis with higher magnification, if you prefer. Derrier's disease, or keratosis follicularis, as first described by Dr. White in 1889. And now known to be mediated by mutations in the gene encoding a different calcium pump. The gene is ATP2A2. And in this situation, it results in a depletion of calcium in the Golgi apparatus. And that seems to be associated with the fact that in Derry's disease, in addition to acanthalysis, there's also prominent dyskeratosis, creating that epidermal reaction pattern that we call acantholytic dyskeratosis. In Derry's disease, the acantholytic dyskeratosis tends to be fairly diffuse and associated with epidermal hyperplasia, reflecting the clinical presentation as confluent plaques. Again, with that characteristic distribution of acanthalysis mostly in the lower epidermis with overlying dyskeratosis in the form of core rons and grains.
And although I mentioned that in acantholytic dyskeratosis that the acantholysis tends to be suprabasilar, in this example, it appears to be mostly intraspinous, but all still intraepidermal. Anyone with a clinical diagnosis for this case? Here's one additional clinical image, as well as some histopathology. And if you said either transient acantholytic dermatosis or Grover's disease, you'd be right. There are a growing number of histologic variants of Grover's disease, but for this session, we're just going to focus on the first two. So with Grover's disease, the acantholytic dyskeratosis is identical to that of Derrier's disease, except that in Grover's disease, the lesions are exclusively papular, and so histologically, the changes are exclusively focal. Focal acantholytic dyskeratosis, reflecting the focal papular nature of the clinical lesions. And the abbreviation FAD is sometimes used. One of the more recently described histologic variants of Grover's disease is the vesicular or pseudoherpetic variant. But in this exceptional case, there are true viral cytopathic changes superimposed upon Grover's disease, a phenomenon that has also been described. The pemphigus-like histologic variant of Grover's disease is characterized by suprabasilar acantholysis mimicking pemphigus vulgaris. And at high magnification, some fields are indistinguishable. So it's the clinical correlation and if needed a negative DIF study that will confirm the correct diagnosis of Grover's disease. One additional example of relatively subtle and also focal changes of suprabasilar acantholysis consistent with the pemphigus-like variant of Grover's disease. Paraneoplastic pemphigus is characterized by very prominent and often severe oral mucositis or stomatitis and is associated with multiple possible antigen targets. In general, proteins from the Plakin family are most characteristic of paraneoplastic pemphigus, but as you can see, the cadherin proteins, the des desmogliins, can also be associated in many cases. The wide spectrum of autoantibody targets is presumably reflected in the wider spectrum of histopathologic features in perineoplastic pemphigus with variable cleavage, including classic pemphigus vulgaris type superblazer cleavage, as well as subepidermal clefting, and often superimposed interface changes, either vacuolar or lichenoid in pattern. Here's an area showing mostly vacuolar interface changes with rare necrotic keratinocytes and without overt acantholysis. Typically, other areas will show acantholysis, most characteristically in the suprabasilar zone. And eosinophilic spongiosis or neutrophilic spongiosis are frequently present as are the necrotic keratinocytes. The combined acantholytic and interface changes characteristic of perineoplastic pemphigus is reflected on the DIF findings with both intercellular, that chicken wire pattern of pemphigus with additional basement membrane zone deposition, usually for IgG or C3. But with a wide spectrum of changes, both clinically, histologically, and on immunofluorescence, a negative DIF result does not exclude perineoplastic pemphigus. And interestingly, even a positive DIF does not necessarily confirm perineoplastic pemphigus. So DIF testing is not the diagnostic gold standard in perineoplastic pemphigus. Rather, most would agree that serum studies are most definitive, typically indirect immunofluorescence with rat bladder transitional epithelium being ideal and most sensitive, or alternatively ELISA for specific targets that are most characteristic, such as envoplakin.
And so DIF findings in perineoplastic pemphigus can be somewhat variable. It's been reported that you can have a completely negative DIF result in a clinically and serologically proven perineoplastic pemphigus. And this other variation of the rule, that a positive DIF does not necessarily confirm PNP, was driven home to me by this case from several years ago. Depicted here is the DIF result with C3 showing a strong linear deposition along the basement membrane zone, but also a little bit of basal or epidermal cell surface staining. And the H&E on this case showed more of a pemphigus vulgaris pattern with suprabasilar acantholysis. So I thought, and this was a, uh, a young patient, so I thought this probably was perineoplastic pemphigus. But it turned out that the serologic studies were positive only for desmoglein 3. Let's now take a look at subepidermal blistering disorders. Starting off with the cleavage planar location, well, that's pretty simple at the H&E level. It's, it's at the DE junction. Similarly, we're frequently limited about how much we can say about mechanisms of subepidermal blister formation at the H&E level. We cannot see acantholysis at the hemidesmosome. We can't tell if the split is above or below the lamina densa. And so unless we see marked papillary dermal edema or severe interface changes, there's not really much we can say beyond subepidermal split. But we do have a third weapon for this approach, and that is the characteristic of the inflammatory host response. So we can substratify by eosinophil versus neutrophil predominant or cell poor. Here is a subepidermal blister for your histologic diagnosis. Is the host response mostly neutrophils, eosinophils, or cell poor? Here's some clinical images of porphyria cutanea tarda, PCT, mediated by a deficiency in the enzyme uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. This is a classical subepidermal cell poor blister typically occurs on chronically sun-exposed acral skin. Evidence by the thick compact stratum corneum, hypergranulosis, and a lack of hair follicles. With preservation of the dermal papillae within the subepidermal blister floor, a feature known as festooning. Characteristic, but not diagnostically specific for PCT. More diagnostically specific are the histopathologic features in superficial dermal blood vessels with markedly thickened vessel walls due to a hyaline perivascular material that can be highlighted by PAS stain and represents excess basement membrane material as a consequence of the repeated phototoxic injury, endothelial injury, and repair due to excess porphyrins. Some observers have likened the appearance of these thickened vessel walls to that of a donut, perhaps a squished strawberry mini donut. This hyaline perivascular material will be highlighted by immunoglobulins or complement on direct immunofluorescence testing, and one might additionally see nonspecific deposition along the overlying basement membrane zone at the dermal epidermal junction. Caterpillar bodies are a relatively specific histopathologic feature in porphyrias present within the mid portion of the subepidermal blister roof. On H&E, it looks like an eosinophilic hyaline material, and it's highlighted by PAS staining. Do you see them? The more you look, the more you find. I think I found one. And once you're clued in, you can even spot them from scanning magnification. Characteristically present within the mid portion of the epidermal blister roof. And again, highlighted by PAS or PASD staining, again reflecting the presence of entrapped basement membrane material. And in a case like this, they seem to be coming in pretty handy. Since I'm not really seeing any a strawberry mini donuts in the upper dermis. The caterpillar bodies have always had a special place in my heart since I first learned about them during my residency days from Dr. Barbara Egbert and colleagues.
Subsequently, Dr. John Mays and colleagues looked at the caterpillar bodies ultra-structurally at the electron microscopic level and confirmed the presence of the basement membrane material within them. My colleagues and I at the University of Connecticut looked at a larger series of cases and confirmed that, in fact, the caterpillar bodies were highly specific for PCT. And in an interesting side note, we looked at the festooning, and although it certainly is highly characteristic of PCT, it also was seen in a number of other disorders, including bullous pemphigoid, a disease in which I feel like I see festooning fairly frequently. And a brief shout out to my colleagues, Diane Haas, Adrian Burke, Michael Murphy, and Jane Grant Kells. I'll just briefly mention the differential diagnosis with pseudoporphyria, which by H&E and sometimes even also by DIF is indistinguishable from porphyria cutanea tarda. So clinical correlation and porphyrin studies may be required. The differential diagnosis for a cell poor subepidermal blister might also include bullosis diabeticorum. However, direct immunofluorescence will be negative and sometimes the cleavage plane is intraepidermal. A traumatic bulla secondary to a burn or extreme heat typically would exhibit a subepidermal split in conjunction with overlying confluent necrosis. In contrast, a friction blister is typically intraepidermal, and of course, DIF is negative in traumatic bulli. Bullous pemphigoid is the most common immunobullous disorder, subepidermal or otherwise, and is characterized by two antigen targets. We expect tense blisters, as with any subepidermal process, and classically the inflammatory host response is rich in eosinophils, although with so many different cases being encountered, it's not surprising that there will be variants, including neutrophilic and cell poor. Perilesional direct immunofluorescence will show linear C3 and or IgG along the dermal epidermal junction. And at this point, I think it's uh, a good chance to review where are the ideal biopsy sites for these different procedures. So in these two black circles above, which one do you think is ideal for H&E and which for DIF? From my perspective, for the H&E specimen, I would like to see the very edge of the blister so I can best determine the cleavage plane, the location of the split, as well as possibly the mechanism of the blister formation. Whereas for the direct immuno immunofluorescence, we wish to have a completely intact epidermis because if we have a pre-existing split, there may be time for the autoantibodies to degrade, resulting in a false negative DIF result. So completely intact epidermis is ideal, and in order to achieve that, the biopsy should be obtained from completely non-lesional skin. Sometimes we're surprised how much microscopic separation there is, even in biopsies obtained from clinically non-lesional skin. And here is a subepidermal blister with many inflammatory cells within it, mostly eosinophils. Here is a relatively cell poor example. Gestational pemphigoid is a pregnancy associated variant of bullous pemphigoid, also known as pemphigoid gestationis and historically by the misnomer herpes gestationis. And at the H&E level, it can be identical to bullous pemphigoid, although there is a predilection for characteristically teardrop shaped vesicles, marked papillary dermal edema, sometimes basal layer necrosis. And on DIF testing, the findings again can be identical to bullous pemphigoid, but there is a relatively stronger predilection for linear C3 as an isolated immunoreactant in these cases. Although the pathogenic antibodies in gestational pemphigoid are historically felt to be IgG1 or else IgG4. In this example, at scanning magnification, I'm really only seeing a single intraepidermal or subepidermal vesicle without marked papillary dermal edema. A somewhat teardrop shaped intraepidermal vesicle with associated spongiosis. reminding us that we can still potentially make a definitive diagnosis even if fully developed changes are not present, particularly if we see ancillary clues such as the presence of eosinophilic spongiosis. And probably the only potential clue in a case with subtle 
histopathology such as this one that could still be subsequently confirmed by DIF testing. And remembering that immunobullous disorders are number one on the differential diagnosis for eosinophilic spongiosis. With eosinophils very characteristically aggregating near and within the dermal epidermal junction, sometimes in conjunction with junctional vacuoles. DIF testing shows continuous linear deposition of C3 and or IgG. Sometimes with an appreciable N serrated staining pattern. Mucous membrane pemphigoid is a scarring or cicatricial form of pemphigoid that may affect multiple mucosal surfaces, including conjunctiva, subepidermal blister with variable inflammation, and superficial fibrosis or scarring. In this example, we only have the dermis, the subepidermal blister floor, and we kind of have to look between the inflammatory cells to see character characteristic scarring with kind of parallel east-west collagen and vertically oriented north-south blood vessels. Amidst an inflammatory host response with neutrophils and plasma cells. With other areas showing the epithelial blister roof. With a mixed inflammatory infiltrate including neutrophilic spongiosis. In ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, the DIF findings are the same but a variety of different antigen targets have been identified, including alpha-6, beta-4, integrin. Linear IgA bullous dermatosis, or linear IgA disease, is a subepidermal blistering disorder associated with prominent neutrophils. Clinically, it can be quite distinctive with an annular arrangement of vesicular bullous lesions, so-called crown of jewels, and is mediated in the classic lamina lucida variant by autoantibodies that target fragments or extracellular polypeptides of the minor bolus pemphigoid antigen or BP180, BP antigen 2. Vancomycin is a classic drug trigger. At scanning magnification in this case, we can clearly see a subepidermal blister that is somewhat sparsely inflammatory but that on closer inspection near the edge of the blister clearly contains many inflammatory cells, mostly neutrophils, sometimes in conjunction with marked papillary dermal edema. And the findings on DIF are essentially identical to those of pemphigoid, except that instead of C3 and IgG, it's IgA. Dermatitis herpetiformis is mediated by autoantibodies directed against epidermal transglutaminase and is characterized by papulovesicles with predilection for the elbows and buttocks and severe itch. Similar to linear IgA bullous dermatosis, biopsies show subepidermal clefting with neutrophils. Aggregating within and filling dermal papillae a distinctive finding sometimes characterized as papillary dermal microabscesses or papillary microabscesses. DIF testing shows a pathognomonic staining pattern with granular deposition of IgA along and below the dermal epidermal junction accentuated within dermal papillae. And so in contrast to the more continuous linear deposition in other subepidermal bolus disorders, in dermatitis herpetiformis, the staining is somewhat more variable, requiring one to examine the entire length of the epidermal surface. Less commonly, a fibrillary pattern of IgA will be present within the dermal papillae. And looking back at the various antigen targets within the basement membrane zone, the staining pattern is less precise, with epidermal transglutaminase localized to the epidermal keratinocytes, but the deposition of, of IgA spanning the length of the dermal epidermal junction and underlying papillary dermis.
relatively nonspecific findings are not uncommonly encountered and include papillary dermal edema, subcorneal pustules, and examples where the more characteristic findings are only focally present with plenty of distractors in other areas of the biopsy. With only a little bit of papillary dermal edema and no suggestion of a subepidermal blister with neutrophils in this field, except on higher magnification where sparse neutrophils and eosinophils are evident, and other areas showing nonspecific crust with no apparent neutrophils and only a lonely eosinophil, more suggestive of bullous pemphigoid. But in deeper sections, somewhat off-center, we do indeed have neutrophils filling dermal papillae. So the deeper sections are sometimes what is needed to save the day and make the diagnosis, especially when the disease has a reputation for showing very focal findings. And so I have a short list of disorders for which I will always routinely get deeper sections if the initial slide is not diagnostic and I do not have a better explanation. And two of those disorders are part of this lecture. Epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita, EBA, is a very rare subepidermal immunobullous disorder that nevertheless frequently enters the differential diagnosis with bullous pemphigoid. It's mediated by autoantibodies against the type 7 collagen anchoring fibrils in the sublamina densa zone and is thus associated with scarring and milia formation. Subepidermal blister with sparse inflammation, cell poor. Although at higher magnification in this case, I do appreciate sparse eosinophils in the superficial dermis and inflammatory variants of EBA are recognized, highlighting the difficult differential with bullous pemphigoid or cicatricial pemphigoid. DIF testing for EBA typically reveals continuous linear IgG along the dermal epidermal junction, and one might appreciate a U serrated staining pattern, which is typical of sub lamina densa immunobullous disorders, typically affecting the type 7 collagen. So the other disorder that shows this same pattern is bullous lupus erythematosus. Like EBA, mediated by autoantibodies directed against the type 7 collagen anchoring fibrils, usually in patients with a known history of SLE. The histopathology is similar to linear IgA disease with subepidermal sub blisters with neutrophils and sometimes dermatitis herpetiformis-like papillary microabscesses. Additional features can include vasculitis and other characteristic features of lupus. And remember, there's a second mechanism by which blisters can form in lupus, and that would simply be a, a very severe interface dermatitis. In this example of bullous lupus, the image shows the edge of a subepidermal blister and a relatively sparse infiltrate with neutrophils, evoking consideration of a differential diagnosis with EBA or mucous membrane pemphigoid early lesion. In this case, the denser infiltrate might evoke consideration of the differential diagnosis with linear IgA disease. But at higher magnification amidst the infiltrate, we can see some evidence of vascular fibrin, more suggestive of lupus. And on direct immunofluorescence testing, we would not expect just a single immunoreactant. We would expect more, more of a lupus band, so-called full house pattern of deposition with variable immunoglobulins and complement and possibly a U serrated staining pattern consistent with a sub lamina densa target. In addition to the linear or linear granular deposition along the epidermal basement membrane zone that would suggest bullous lupus or perhaps a lupus band, an additional ancillary diagnostic clue that one might encounter in DIF specimens is speckled nuclear epidermal IgG which is associated with mixed connective tissue disease as well as lupus and occasionally seen in other connective tissue disorders. And finally, we have the SALT split direct immunofluorescence technique. 
in which the specimen is placed for many hours in hypernormal one molar sodium chloride to induce a split at the lamina lucida such that sub lamina densa targets will stain on the floor of the subepidermal salt induced split and these would be characteristic of eba and bolus lupus whereas in contrast bolus pemphigoid would stain in the blister roof